everybody. Thanks so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, good welcome. It's uh, very good to see you all, very good to, to welcome you all uh, here tonight. Thanks so much for supporting our work and for coming out tonight. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We are we are a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We always like to acknowledge that we gather uh, on the traditional land of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Delaware tribes. We also acknowledge that many of these indigenous peoples were dispossessed of their homelands by the U.S. government. And we pray that what we do here will honor them and those present among us today. We also always like to say thank you to Plymouth Church. You know, our first program uh, was 19 years ago in this very room. And from the very beginning, for the last 19 years, Plymouth Church has been a, a partner and an ally in our work. So we want to say thanks to the pastors and the uh, uh, leaders and the people of Plymouth Church for their uh, partnership. Jim's here again tonight with Friends of the Third World. And so Jim, uh, thanks for being back here again. And stop over and say hi to Jim and take a look at their wares before you leave tonight. You have on uh, your uh, tables uh, some flyers with our upcoming programs. I'll just uh, highlight uh, a couple of them. Uh, our annual gala is coming up on Saturday, November the 4th. <coughs> and uh, I've asked Phil to say a word about Diana Mutu uh, during his talk, but uh, she is really one of, as, as, I, as it says there, one of the foremost spokespersons uh, for Palestinian rights, both in Palestine, but all around the world. She's been featured on CNN, Al Jazeera, and other international news venues. She's a former uh, spokesperson for the PLO Negotiating Committee, and uh, she's working us in, in between uh, her online courses at Harvard and working at the Institute for Middle East Understanding, based in Ramallah. Uh, in Palestine. So we're really fortunate to have Diana here. We're excited to be welcoming her and please, please register for the gala. Talk to one of us, to Ani or Pam or myself or Linda uh, before you leave tonight if you want to register. And we're really encouraging you, uh, if you haven't before, to be a benefactor this year. Uh, we can only do what we do uh, because of the support uh, of folks like yourself. So thank you for your support and please sign up to be a benefactor or at least sign up to come to our gala this year on November the 4th. And I just want to highlight just one other of the programs. Uh, this is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights on December the 10th. And so uh, we wanted to really highlight the theme of environmental justice uh, because of all the issues having to do with climate change and all the rest. And so we wanted to invite uh, one of uh, uh, a representative of the indigenous peoples of the U.S. And so we've invited Crystal Tubles from Honor the Earth, the executive director of Honor the Earth. We're bringing her in from Montana to be our speaker, and she'll be speaking in this room uh, on Sunday evening, December the 10th. I think that's all the announcements I have other than introducing our speaker for tonight, uh, although he's feeding himself right now, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to stall here. Uh, uh, Phil Weiss is the journalist founder of the must-read daily online news source, Mondo Weiss. It's described as uh, an independent website devoted to informing readers about developments in Israel and Palestine and related U.S. foreign policy. It provides news and analysis unavailable to the mainstream media regarding the struggle for Palestinian human rights. And I'll just say for all those of us who are in the movement, it really is a must-read news source. Any, everybody who's doing the work that we're doing reads Mondo Weiss every day. Phil's written for New York Magazine, 
Harper's, Esquire, and others. By the way, you have some handouts also on your tables about Mondo Weiss, and write it down or pick one up or uh, as you like, but take it with you. Those who know Phil know him to be someone with a, a strong moral grounding and a tenacious commitment to speaking the truth no matter the cost. He, he tells about how he was fired once upon a time by Jared Kushner. <laughs> a badge of honor. He's concerned both for uh, full civil, political, and human rights for Palestinians, as well as what Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism in the land means for Judaism and the Jewish people. It's an honor to welcome Phil to Fort Wayne. So Phil, take it away. Thank you, Michael. And thanks for having me. I've had a wonderful visit to Fort Wayne. I'm enjoying myself. Uh, I don't I usually get nervous from four speeches. I'm not that nervous. I guess you gotta worry about that. Um, uh, you know, it is a great, you are very fortunate in your next speaker, more than me, even, uh, Deanna Butu. Um, so, Michael asked me to say something. I just, before I get into my, you know, speech, I want to tell you a story about Deanna Butu that you should ask her about. And she might tell you a little more about the individual in the story. I, I'm not at liberty to say who it was. But, um, Deanna is uh, uh, an attorney and a former negotiator um, for the PLO, I believe. She's a very worldly, sophisticated uh, person, a uh, lovely person, uh, can handle herself in any situation, unlike myself. And um, she, uh, so I was having dinner with her in Ramallah once, and we were talking about the reporters from America who were out there in uh, Israel and Palestine, and um, which I, is, is a, an obsession of mine. Uh, I'm, I'm a longtime journalist. I'll tell you a little bit more about my own story in a moment. But um, uh, I, I was formerly in the mainstream of American journalism. I'm happily no longer in the mainstream. But um, I'm very interested in how journalists come out to Israel and Palestine and how they handle the situation. And there was one journalist I was kind of fat, and many of them are Jews like myself. And um, so Deanna was telling me about this one that she would meet with fairly regularly, wanted to hear the Palestinian perspective, an American Jewish reporter, and actually a Zionist, uh, this reporter. Um, and uh, for a well-known publication, but I wish I could tell you. Anyway, Deanna may tell you, I'm, but, so she was talking to this person, and, and the person is hearing about, you know, one democratic state with equal rights for everyone. And the reporter then said, um, they, they would have dinner, it was very informal. The reporter said, um, but when, when that happens, when there's one democratic state, and what will happen to the Hatikva, that's the national anthem, the, is Hatikva in Hebrew is the hope. What will happen to the Hatikva and the flag? And Deanna said, uh, well, they'll go in the trash. And <laughs> this person said, oh, well, wait, 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 wait. Uh, what will happen to that? She repeated the question. Deanna said, it won't be, we can't have them in a state that's, uh, that's a, a state for all its citizens. They'll go in the trash. And I, it, was a, um, it was a wonderful moment for me um, because I can, uh, I got a little shocking to hear, and I know this person uh, uh, probably wet their pants when I heard that. <laughs> um, but it's, um, I think that shock is an important part of uh, the learning process we've all been on uh, here, and um, uh, I, it, 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 it reminds me, just I have to tell you another anecdote before I get a little more formal. Um, in 2006, I started this web, uh, this blog. This website began as a blog in 2006, and I remember walking up Broadway late at night. I'd gone to some event with a friend, a Palestinian. I was meeting Palestinians for the first time. I was a little shocked to meet Palestinians 
I'm very culturally, I think I'm, I'm very culturally bound. Um, I don't know how many people in this room, we've all experienced in this modern country, this wonderful diverse country we live in, we've experienced this moving out into broader cultures. And I was in my 50s when I had started this blog, I was, you know, really innocent in a lot of ways. And I was walking up Broadway late at night with a Palestinian. We'd just gone to an event. And I remember him shouting, my goal in life, he was getting wild. We were, he was wandering out to the road, and he said, my goal in life is to end Zionism. And I was, again, I was shocked. It was a little like Deanna Bucci saying, we're gonna throw it in the trap. And, you know, it's like this. And uh, so I remember the next day or so, I called, his name was Safe. I won't say the last name, but, I called Safe and I said, Safe, at that moment, it, it, jumping out into Broadway and saying, my goal in life is to end Zionism, I just found it so exciting and shocking and scary and can I quote you? And he said, oh no, Bill, come on. I mean, I, he was a grad student at Columbia. We were walking up and he'd say, this is really, this is really going to hurt my career. And uh, you can't do that. And I said, okay, I'm just, you know, just checking in. And what I find, the reason I bring that up is not just to tell a story. I mean, I think it's really stunning to me, and, and it's gonna be the theme of my talk. I see the first line here, it says, we are going to win. Um, it is a reflection of the fact, uh, it, it certainly is evidence for my claim that we are going to win, that that happened in 2006, and uh, all these prohibitions and inhibitions were, it was so shocking to me when he said that. I couldn't say that then. And then a few years later, I, found, I heard myself saying, you know, my goal in life is to end Zionism. And now I say uh, very proudly that my goal in life, uh, inside the Jewish community, I have many goals. I mean, I, but one of them is uh, inside the Jewish community, I really want to defeat uh, Zionism, the ideology of Zionism. Uh, the ideology of Zionism has worked out very badly for Jews, for Palestinians, and, and for the world. And so uh, that's a, a conviction that uh, I don't apologize for. And, um, but these shocks, these shocks along the way, including that one with Diana Butu, were important. So I think what I, I'm going to do tonight is. Um, I, unfortunately, Michael said that I could speak for 45 minutes, and it's a little, it, it feels like a Castro length of, you know, speech for me. I'm gonna, so, uh, I'm gonna tell you some of my personal story, uh, and then I'm going to um, uh, segue into uh, a more um, uh, detached analysis of why I think we're gonna win, and then I hope that we would have a discussion and questions. Um, I feel that, uh, we're in a church, and certainly in a wonderful church, and um, a lot of the people in this room are, uh, I, I know from having met them, are like myself, uh, have a religious element in their character, and um, ideas like calling and uh, being, uh, bearing witness are very important to many people in this room, as they are to me. So uh, when I come to some place like Indiana or lately Lincoln Mass, anywhere I go, it's very important to me uh, uh, to learn some of those stories of calling um, because uh, they're so essential to building this movement. Uh, earlier today, uh, Linda and I were talking about when you preach to the choir, what's the value of preaching to the choir? Why do we do that? What isn't preaching to the choir? How do we move beyond the choir? All true. Um, and those are issues, but um, I feel, you know, that um, uh, to reach beyond uh, uh, our special, our very special uh, uh, group, um, uh, Michael's a very special person. He's created an amazing and very special institution. The people in this room I sense and the ones I've met, I know have had experiences like me of uh, suffering and um, vicarious suffering, of uh, solidarity, of being tested, of being denounced, of, being, of losing jobs. So, uh, and um, that's not, those are not, I don't think those are common experiences. I mean, they're, they're certainly, um, for us, they're, they're 
they're extremely important for people who live lives of uh, purpose and meaning. But uh, from a political standpoint, you got to move beyond people for whom a cause uh, causes are attractive and who are willing to stake a lot. We got to move. We got to bring more and more people in, make it more safe uh, for other people who are not as willing to be called anti-Semites uh, or to be smeared or to lose jobs. So um, obviously that's a, that's a political task I'm describing and that's, um, uh, we'll come to that. So I want to tell this person a couple of personal stories about uh, how I refused this calling uh, for a long time and it's a source of some shame to me, uh, but it's also revealing I think about the Jewish community, um, which is my community. I have a, I have a uh, um, I love my community in a lot of ways. I mean, it's, it was, it's what made me. Uh, Jewish culture made me. Um, uh, uh, my father was a professor, and um, uh, my mother has a very um, strong kind of tribal Jewish culture thing. So I'm extremely Jewish, and 23andMe says so too. And uh, <laughs> I... Uh, um, <clears throat> That's what made me, and so uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm very proud of that background, but I'm also extremely aware of the ways in, that, in which that uh, culture became an inhibitor to this calling. And um, I, I thought about it today because I, I, there was a lot of talk on MSNBC about how Biden is opening the door to some of these Republicans giving them, uh, he's, he's helping them to fight MAGA inside the Republican Party. They can't do it on their own. And um, it reminded me of the fact that I don't think, and, and this I, I don't think, I know, uh, this is one of my strongest convictions, the Jewish community on its own cannot fight Zionism. Uh, the Jewish community is invested in Zionism, deeply invested in Zionism. And I don't know the Republican Party well enough to say of how invested they are in MAGA or Trump, all that, but they certainly, it's a heresy inside the Republican Party to criticize Trump in a, it's a heresy, okay. And there are some heretics, God bless them. Um, and, uh, but certainly I think that that holds for the Jewish community now and has been the case for the last, and all the work I've done on this for the last uh, 18 years. Um, that I came to realize early, the Jewish community on its own could not uh, overcome Zionism. And uh, my personal story is very much of a piece with that in that I'm, I'm by nature a, uh, a rebel, I'm by nature a lefty, I'm a uh, social justice type, and yet I had resisted this issue for many, many years. And so I could be very, uh, I, you know, I, I'm mouthy, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not shy, I'm bold, I like to take strong stands. I did that in a lot of issues without a qualm, but on this issue I was inhibited and I bit my tongue, and I'm ashamed of that. So I want to tell you a little about why and how that went on, and, um, why, uh, and how I overcame that. Um, so, uh, uh, when I was young, I, um, and, and I didn't get to, and part of that is that this website, I, be, I began it as a blog in 2006, and that's really my maturity is since the age of 50, I really came into this understanding and came to what I regard as uh, a, a noble purpose in which I have many friends and uh, associates. But I, I sort of put off history until I was age 50 and resisted this calling, even though it was mine. This is my community's issue. Uh, I was raised in it, and I recognized the problem, but I couldn't deal. So when I was young, I remember in college, uh, I, I had heard that Israel, the settlements were expansionist, and I remember saying to a friend at the college newspaper, uh, you know, I, uh, yeah, Israel seems like a good place, but I hear they're expansionist, you know, and that's not, and then he, I was promptly lectured by this guy, who, then became a very famous journalist. Uh, you can't make such an assertion about Israel unless you know the Balfour Declaration and know the history of Transjordan. So here I was at age 18 being lectured, catechized 
um, and given a literacy test uh, before I could open my mouth on an issue. Now, instead of saying to him, Eric, uh, Eric Brindell later uh, worked for, I, I believe he worked for Monaco Bacon, he certainly promoted Bacon in the United States. He was a son of Holocaust survivors, very important part of the story. Instead of saying, Eric, you know, I didn't know about, you know, a lot of things about Vietnam. I didn't know a lot of things about uh, gay people. I didn't know a lot about civil rights. I'd never been to the South. Uh, and I thought, uh, Jim Crow, there was a problem there. You know, uh, I didn't have the wherewithal. I didn't have the self-possession to take him on. I accepted this prohibition from this person when I was 18 years old. And one of the reasons I accepted it uh, was that um, uh, he was the son of Holocaust survivors, and the trauma of the Holocaust uh, is something that obviously has resonated throughout the Jewish people. And uh, we can think uh, we think that slavery. Uh, well, we know that slavery has a, a, a intergenerational trauma component for uh, among uh, uh, African Americans. It's uh, a legacy that is going to take many generations to overcome. Uh, for all members of our society. Uh, certainly, the, the Holocaust, in which many living people remember, um, has had that effect on scar the Jewish people in deep ways. And my wife, who's not Jewish, uh, when she met my mother, she goes, um, uh, feels like your mother went through the Holocaust and she was raised in New Jersey. And, uh, and I thought it was kind of funny at the time. It, you know, I said, yeah, that's my mother. You know, uh, my mother would say, I had six kids, one for each million, you know, and um, to make up for what the Nazis had done. So, I mean, uh, now I wouldn't, I, I don't find it, I, 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 I was too flip or dismissive about that when I was younger. And now I would say, uh, without honoring my mother's feelings completely on this, I would say, yeah, you could be a Jew in New Jersey and feel that trauma, you know, and uh, uh, there were reasons, family reasons, but so this was um, uh, Eric who gave this prohibition to me in college, he had greater status because his parents had survived the Holocaust. And my mother's best friend was someone who lived in Bloomington. Uh, she was a Yiddish poet uh, and her husband was at the neurology department at uh, IU. Um, in the medical school, and Golda, my mother's best friend, was born in Berlin in 1930. Uh, and at age eight, uh, Kristallnacht happened throughout Germany, and Berlin was, a, I guess, a real focus of Kristallnacht. You know, when they, that was the night of broken glass, they broke the Jewish businesses, the storefronts, uh, they burned Jewish businesses, and at that point, uh, Golda's mother turned to her father and said, if you're not leaving now, taking the kids, I'm going. And uh, they were people of means, um, and, or some means, and they got out of there and she came to the United States. And <clears throat> so she, um, uh, and then she, she had this very successful life uh, with an academic husband, became close friends with my mother, and when I was 13 years old, right after, 12 years old, right after the 67 war, the Wormans moved from Bloomington to Jerusalem. And that was a big event in my childhood that my mother's best friend was leaving. And they said, uh, Ellen to my mother, come on, you should come too. Leon can get a job in the anatomy department at Hebrew University. Bob's gonna work at Hebrew University. Starting the neurology department, neurosciences at Hebrew University, you come too. And my parents, no, they were staying in America, but I remember uh, that we would say, well, why did they, why are they leaving? Well, it was so important after the 67 war to build up Israel, and then also it was because there was so much anti-Semitism in Indiana, you know, so, or whatever, in the United States, everywhere there was, any, you know, they didn't feel safe in America, they wanted to be in Israel. So, um, uh, it, it, the funny part of that story is that Gola became a very important figure in my life as I became, uh, as I started to get into this issue. But um, funny part of the story is years later I read 
Bob's books about uh, Israel, living in Israel. He wrote books, and he said, we had to leave Bloomington because we saw all our colleagues' children, our Jewish colleagues, their children were marrying non-Jews. So we were going to all these weddings of Jews and non-Jews. We didn't want our kids to marry non-Jews. That was what's going to happen. And so we moved to Israel. So there wasn't anti-Semitism in Bloomington that was driving them out. It was uh, philo-Semitism. It was the experience of assimilation uh, that my parents were willing to risk with their children. And of my mother's six kids, uh, I guess three married non-Jews. Um, so uh, that is obviously a big part of um, the uh, Jewish experience in moving to Israel is to try to preserve the Jewish people. And again, there's a lot of trauma there. Uh, you know, if, if your people have been decimated by the Holocaust, um, you, you may resort to such, um, it, it becomes important. But I accepted prohibitions from uh, Golda over the years um, on this issue too. So again, um, uh, I'm talking about these, this calling I felt on the question, and um, uh, I would, uh, I would think, uh, you know, who am I to criticize Israel when I, I grew up with my oldest son, Michael, his picture's on the refrigerator. A couple of years after they moved to Israel, he's in the armed forces, you know, and he's in the tank. And who, who am I to criticize Israel when Golda's kids are taking these giant, you know, they're fighting to, to preserve Jewish history, fighting to preserve the Jewish state. So I felt a communal uh, obligation not to criticize Israel. And um, uh, when I finally started going there, I remember saying to my mother, uh, and then I started writing about it, uh, that began in 2006. Um, I remember I would say to my mother, uh, she would say, why, my mother said, why are you writing these vile things? Um, you know, why, you know, this is, uh, I, I looked at your website and it's vile. I said, I mean, I had many different reactions to my mother over the years. I mean, some of them, you know, uh, uh, very immature. Um, but, um, uh, and, you know, spent a few years on the couch. But anyway, um, uh, no, but I, when I had the self-possession to say, you know, when I would be, I would be, I'd say, Mom, it's apartheid. You know, that's why it's apartheid. You raised me uh, to, uh, you, who did we worship in our household growing up? Uh, Schwerner, um, Cheney, and um, Goodman, you know, uh, killed in 1963 in the uh, Freedom Summer. Those martyrs, you know, you raised me to respect those people and to uh, be very proud that two of those martyrs were Jewish. And uh, it's war time over there. So uh, they were called to fight Jim Crow and segregation. No, I, this is ours. This is ours. You know, I'm not, this is ours. Uh, I didn't have such substantive discussions with my mother always about this. I never have really. She's that interested. Um, but uh, what, I, what happened for me, the reason that I finally overcame these uh, prohibitions uh, or, or, or started on this path was um, uh, in 2002 when uh, I said, my brother said to me, um, what, what do you think of the Iraq war? And I said, uh, what, do you, what do I think of the Iraq war? It's the worst goddamn idea in the world. I mean, I've been in the streets against the Iraq war. What do you think? I mean, it's a crazy idea. They should, you know, you know I was getting very upset about it. And he said, well, I hear what you're saying, and we both demonstrated against the Vietnam War, but my Jewish newspaper says this war could be good for Israel. And, um, and uh, that was just uh, in a moment of epiphany for me. Um, deeply, deeply upsetting. Um, still very upsetting. Uh, the idea that um, I mean, my, my people, my brother, uh, my family would overthrow our values uh, um, because something, uh, a war might be good for a country very far away. Um, and I, I realized how deep was the investment of my community in Israel 
I realized how wrong-headed uh, that investment was, and I realized I was 50 years old, plus 47, whatever. I realized I couldn't escape this anymore, and uh, that's when I began to uh, uh, write about Iraq. I wrote, started this blog. I was in a, uh, I had gone to an elite college. Um, I, uh, at the college newspaper, I spent all my time at the college newspaper. Um, it was a Jewish boys club, uh, as my uh, Irish Catholic friend would tell me. Um, and uh, it, it was, uh, I loved it, loved every minute. Uh, formed these great friendships. People who were gonna propel me out into the world, they were my mafia. Career-wise, I worked at many great publications, all through these connections that began at college. And um, I, then I watched many of these uh, same journalists, uh, elite journalists, support the Iraq War. And some of them supported it because it was for the same reason my brother was on the fence, because it was good for Israel. And so at that time, uh, I mean, we, everyone knows in this room, I think, you know, what calling means. I mean, you know, at that point, you, you know, you want a career, or if your career is supporting this kind of war, and supporting, and supporting this war, and blinding yourself about Israel, go for it. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I couldn't do that. And uh, I, I just felt like um, uh, the journalists that I revered during Vietnam were people who exposed the Vietnam War. And I felt that the parts of the Iraq War that were related to Israel, because some push, people who pushed that war, many of them were uh, right-wing Zionists. I felt that as a journalist, I had to expose that. And I had a responsibility to my uh, public, to my countrymen, uh, country women, uh, my fellow citizens, uh, to tell them what I know about uh, Zionism inside the Jewish community. So that's when it began for me after the war. And then I started this blog. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just conclude the personal section by relating my last uh, interactions with Golden. Um, when I first went out, so I first went to Israel in 2006. Um, I was 50, and for the Lebanon War. And I could pretend when I saw Golda that I had come out to cover the war, which I had. And I was working for the New York Observer, a weekly newspaper in New York that Jared Kushner had just bought. And then a college friend had hired me uh, to work for. I was a columnist, and he, I was doing this blog, which my college friend called Mondo Weiss, because he says, whatever's on your mind, Phil, just put in there. And you know, as the weeks and months went by, he was doing a blog, you, what was on my mind was Zionism and the Iraq War and just the tragedy of it all. And so I finally got out to Israel. And um, I should say that apropos of my belief that Jews can't do this without Christians, you know, my wife's family had preceded me to Israel. Um, my, my mother-in-law said, you know, I smuggled, she would say, I smuggled sheets into the hospital in Bethlehem. I didn't even know what that meant. But, you know, why was she, why was she so free, you know? Spiritually, why was she so free? I mean, she went with an Episcopal church group out of Richmond, Virginia. But it was like, wow, Barbara's is a lot freer than you are, man, you know? I wasn't smuggling sheets. So that was a that was helpful to have uh, Christians uh, goading me, and uh, again, it speaks to a theme of mine that the Jewish community I cannot do this on its own. So um, I visited Gola the first time uh, in 2006, and she sort of was on to me because she said, "This is not an Arab house," you know, which I didn't even know what an Arab house was. But she was telling me she was making this confession. And she said, and Bob had just died, and she goes, we were talking, and she says, I want to explain what's going on here. Bob explained it to me. The Arabs will never accept us here. 
So there must be one war after another until they learn to accept us, one war after another. And I just remember walking out of that and thinking, what kind of vision is that for a society? I didn't have the wherewithal to say, Golden, that's no vision for a future, I'm sorry. One war after another, they don't, maybe you should look at why they don't want to accept you. What's wrong with the constitution of your society? You know, I mean, I didn't say we should throw in the trash, but you know, that was a few years down the road. This is 06. And, um, uh, but I lied to Golda on the several occasions that I went out, those first, I met, went, started going many times. And I would, she said, why are you here again? I said, oh, you know, and I sort of lied to her. And then she, um, she found my, the website and, one, and she read what I was writing. And, oh, uh, and she said, oh, and she had said, uh, and, and so she um, wrote me this vicious letter, email. I, I was sitting, I was actually in the Israeli airport when I received this uh, email from her, and it said, I just discovered your website. You should be so ashamed of yourself, what you're doing to Jews. Uh, you should go do something else. This is hateful. Uh, you must be doing this because of your failed literary career and your unresolved uh, conflict with your father, um, Gola. And, um, you know, I, I find it a little bit amusing, but uh, at the time, it speaks to my uh, immaturity and uh, how, you know, how, how hard it was for me that I just didn't quickly, I just accepted. I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed. And instead of just like leaving the airport, I, you know, just go dressing her down, you know, uh, just going and saying, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. I've been in the West Bank. What you're doing in the name of the Jewish people is a great shame. And it's destroying people's lives. It's killing people. And I am trying to say, I love my people, and I'm trying to save them from this legacy. Because this is a just tremendous, tragic error, and you are deluded. Now, what few conversations I had before she died, she would say, Phil, Philip, you do not understand that Arabs hate us. They will always hate us. The world hates Jews. And they will, the world just hates Jews. They want to kill us. And there's a person who escaped Nazi Germany. So I cut her a giant break. But it's not her, her historical frame and legacy and trauma are not mine. And um, certainly, this is an issue that has to be healed inside the Jewish community. Um, I, on that trip in 2006, my first trip, I saw um, apartheid before my eyes, as I think many of you have seen when you go out there. It's inescapable. Jimmy Carter said it in 2006. I was in Hebron, and um, I, there was a South African delegation that we ran into in Hebron, and the South Africans said to me, um, uh, I lived through apartheid, this is worse than apartheid. And he went through the reasons it was worse than apartheid. Now, I, my jaw was on the floor, I took his name down, his notes, and I came back, and for the New York Observer newspaper, I wrote this article, it's headline, it's worse than apartheid, and Jared Kushner on the newspaper. And so it was only a matter of months before I got fired. And you know, my editor, given that Mondo Weiss's name, wonderful man, called me into his office and said, you know, we're Zionists here, so uh, you gotta go, Phil. So I, you know, it was appropriate that I left. I shouldn't have been working for a Zionist publication. And the website is, uh, has been much stronger by being independent of that community, once again. I was in a community, in a very Jewish community, and I don't think the organizing, I, I, you can't put your, I don't know if this word is right, the tabernacle, you can't put it in the Jewish community and organize on this. It's just not, you know, you can have one foot in that community, and I certainly have a foot in that community, but you need allies from other communities that uh, understand this. So I got fired by Jared Kushner uh, a few months later, and, um, that's, since then, it's just been, the site is burgeoned. Um, 
Uh, I'm proud of what Michael says about it, that it's a go-to resource. If any of you is inclined to give us money, uh, I can be shameless about it now because I'm making so little. I'm sort of becoming more and more, I'm taking Social Security, um, you know. But please, there's a VOR uh, uh, B B B B code or something you want, and there are things on the table. So let me uh, promote the site. Let me just move uh, uh, in what time. Uh, Michael, where am I at? Give me a minute. Uh, I guess three hours. No, uh, no, I, no. I think ten more. Ten, ten more minutes. That's great. We got ten or fifteen more. Okay. Oh my God. Yes. Great. Okay. I'm I'm going to get done soon, and then we can move to questions if you have any. I want to tell you the reasons that we're going to win, um, and uh, and I'm sorry that I went into such great length about my personal story, but I whatever. It's a church. It's important. <laughs> um, so uh, I think there are three reasons that I can. I can I, I, earlier today, I think it was Quentin who said to me, "I was there in uh, 2006, and there in 2017, and it's just gotten so much worse for Palestinians in that those 11 years." And certainly people who have gone in 2017 and then back in 2021, they say it's just getting worse for Palestinians. It's just getting, and I say that I, I agree. I agree that it is getting worse for Palestinians. And yet I think that that has created, there are great openings in the American discourse around Palestine that have occurred in that period. Um, so that in 2018, Israel passed the nation state law that said um, uh, Jews have the exclusive right of self-determination in the land of Israel. They, the Arabic is a second class language. It was explicit apartheid, as Ida Thomas Lyman, a member of the Palestinian member of the Israeli parliament, she came to the United States and said, this is an apartheid law. So it has become nakedly apartheid over there, and apartheid with fascistic, racist ministers. It's, uh, it's worse and worse for Palestinians, but it has had a huge effect on the discourse in the United States. And I think most of you are aware of that. I don't want to belabor these things, but I would point to uh, three important changes. Changes in the Democratic Party, changes in uh, the Jewish community, and finally, uh, the, work, the changes in the progressive community, which we all know so well. In the Democratic Party, the most important note I ever make when I give speeches these days is uh, the word uh, numbers 49 to 38. Um, the latest Gallup poll on American attitudes towards Palestinians and Israelis says in the Democratic Party, 49% uh, are more sympathetic to Palestinians, 38% more sympathetic to Israel. It's the first time in the Democratic Party that 49 that more are sympathetic to Palestinians than Israelis, and it's 49-38. Seven years ago, it was almost 52, I believe, for Israel, 26 to Palestinians. There has been a sea change inside the Democratic Party, a revolution inside the Democratic Party. And the Israel lobby is fully aware of this. Joe Biden is fully aware of this. Um, uh, Andre Carson is fully aware of this, and I can think many of us in the room are fully aware of this sea change. And they are terrified of this sea change at the top of the Democratic Party because so many of the donors to the party are in pro-Israel Jews, who are an important part of the uh, uh, Democratic Party, and they do not want to alienate the um, uh, uh, war chest of the Democratic Party, especially of 2024 coming up. That is why Biden, uh, sent um, uh, 22 um, fresh, fresh first year Congress people just went to Israel on an APAC trip, including Becca Ballant, a good progressive from Vermont, to her shame. She's going on an APAC trip to meet Netanyahu. I don't know if she actually, she may have boycotted that meeting, but they met Netanyahu, they kissed us behind. Um, J Street sent out, a liberal Zionist group sent out Congress people, 14 of them in the February. They met with Netanyahu. So these people are doing this for political reasons. Um, 
because uh, there's an order from the top of the Democratic Party, we do not want the squad to grow. Uh, the squad is the address for pro-Palestinian activism in the Democratic Party, and the squad is growing. And Andre Carson's in there, and uh, Betty McCollum, and Ilan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib, and these are people who use the word apartheid, who call what it is, they call it what it is, and they are uh, standing up for Palestinian rights. And 20 years ago, they would have been run out of the Democratic Party on a rail. Cynthia McKinney was run out of the Democratic Party on a, on a rail. Jim Aberax from South Dakota, uh, or maybe North South Dakota, was run out of the party on a rail. Um, they can't run them out of, on a rail anymore. And that's to uh, the credit of the progressive, the grassroots community that's in this room right now. And uh, our work has been phenomenal. It's a struggle, um, and um, I, I think that um, uh, you know we should be really extremely proud of the work we're doing. It's and but we are creating a base inside the Democratic Party. That's why it's 49 to 38 uh, in sympathy inside the Democratic Party. That's why there's a APAC, the Israel lobby, split off a new branch, Democratic majority for Israel, raising money inside. The Israel lobby inside the Democratic Party specifically to try to kill off the squad. They're not going to be able to kill off the squad. And um, uh, I think that is, uh, uh, that's because of the people in this room. And uh, that's because of all the work we've been doing on this issue. Uh, we have built awareness. We have raised consciousness in this country. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, the nature of struggle, obviously, is it's struggle. And, and people who are called to struggle, uh, they, they like struggle. I mean, they don't, I mean, that, that's what they're called to do. I mean, I, I've been uh, teasing Linda about the fact, I just know that if I was in her house 150 years ago, she'd be running down to, she'd be running down to that Kentucky border and, and on the Underground Railroad. That's what she'd be doing. She would be, that would be the struggle. She would be involved in that. And, so, but this struggle is, is uh, we're succeeding, and um, uh, I just, it, it's just been, uh, um, that I'm very optimistic about it. And I see the changes. The Jewish community is the gatekeeper still in American society on this issue. Joe Biden will, won't do a thing without checking with the Jewish community on this issue. And um, uh, uh, it, it, the Jewish community is changing, and then also the last war, the uh, major war that Israel had against Palestinians in May 2021. Um, there's that famous photo, I don't know if, how many of you know, where uh, Joe Biden goes to address the auto workers in Detroit. He gets out of that airplane, and who's there on the tarmac but Rashida Tlaib? And it was a beautiful moment that that woman was this. Tremendous politician, just a wonderful person. Uh, and Debbie Dingell, I think, was there too. But Rashida Tlaib was up in the president's face in May 2021. And that, we don't want to use expletives, but that war ended after 11 days. And previous wars against uh, mowing the lawn in Gaza went on for weeks and uh, 51 days in uh, 2014, I think. And, uh, 2009, it went on for 30 days, and they stopped just before Obama came in, so that not to embarrass him, uh, but um, or make a problem for him. But in this case, it stopped after 11 days, and and the big reason was Rashida to leave. And I know that Biden was on the phone to Netanyahu saying, "I got these people barked. They're 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 you know, they're biting at my heels, BB. They're biting at my heels, and I, you gotta help me. You gotta help me." That and. It was a wonderful moment that shows that we, we have uh, we have fraction, and he knows that we have the democratic base. So I, I've gone on too long. I appreciate your uh, uh, kind attention and uh, patience uh, through this discussion and uh, my uh, 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 memoir there. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions or hear um, about other people uh, being called to this question. It's very important for me to learn about that. So uh, I, I thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. You didn't do two and three. Come on. Oh, I didn't? No. Well, okay. So I said, 
changed in the Democratic Party, and okay, the Jewish community. I guess I mean just shorthand. I don't want to go on about, but I feel gold is dead. <laughs> so uh, no, and, and it's a joke, but it's also true that that generation that was singed, actually singed by the Holocaust, is um, is is leaving us, and the generation like myself, which does not think that the world just wants to kill Jews. Uh, that was her firm belief. And I quoted earlier today, Norman Mailer once said that Hitler's uh, bitterest legacy for Jews was that um, Hitler had a posthumous victory, he said. And that was that he reduced Jews to this question, is it good for the Jews? And I certainly grew up with that. And it was a feeling that we counted on the world, and the world abandoned us. We're not counting on them anymore. We're going to take care of ourselves. And that ethos, of course, is alive in Israel, which uh, is, you know, is unaccountable. Feels that it's unaccountable. The Eric, the guy who catechized me at college, uh, felt the, the world's unaccount. Uh, uh, we're unaccountable to the world, you know, because my they, they abandoned my. What, what do we have to account for? So I feel like that kind of trauma, that's easy. Yes. And you see young Jews who, um, if you're a young, smart Jew, um, uh, you, you, uh, you, you want to say it's apartheid. You know, it doesn't take as much. I lost two jobs by saying it's apartheid. And I think that, that that's not true, that they can see that they can make careers by being so that the Jewish community's been transformed. And number three. The third one is just uh, was the progressive community that I think that I guess what I would say is that um, one of, one of the shames of progressive community in this country, what, what the, the progressive community will, should be ashamed of, is that um, for many years, for fifty years, people have been saying on the left, we got to do something for the Palestinians. And the progressive community in the United States has resisted that call. So um, uh, the poet uh, Robert Lowell wrote to the poet Elizabeth Bishop in 1968, and he says, all my Jewish friends who I've demonstrated against the Vietnam War would have turned into these hawks for Israel. So he shut his mouth about Israel. And, uh, uh, often, um, uh, uh, African American radicals in this country were saying, "You've got to be for Palestine," and they were shamed as being anti-Semites. And again and again and again, Palestinians were told, Arab Americans were told, "Get to the back of the line in the progressive community. Get to the back of the line." Obama said, "Go to the back of the line," and you know he he said, "We can't touch this issue." And not that he was. But I feel like the progressive community has an accounting on this that, w that is shameful, where we have, has, have, have uh, pushed this issue to the side, subordinated this issue, and now I feel that in the last five or ten years, the um, uh, finally Palestinian voices are central um, in the progressive community. You can't um, you can't speak about this issue on the left. I have a forum without at least having a Palestinian voice there. This website, which as you see, began in the most parochial fashion. I mean, I'm not proud of it, but it's true. I'm the most parochial fashion, the Jewish person trying to come to terms. We, we, are, we have many people from different backgrounds, and we have a few Palestinians working for us. And uh, that's, that's great. I'm so proud of it, and it's absolutely necessary in the progressive community. So I feel that the progressive community has gotten its stuff together and the Democratic Party is still trying to keep us out but so there's three. Thank you. Tony, you had a question. Yes, um you see you got fired from the from the article thing. But yes. do, you, do you know why you got fired from the article? Well I think that um yeah I I He was a Zionist. 
Jared Kushner, who owned, who bought the paper I was working for. He was a dedicated Zionist, and I was working against everything that he cared about. And um, so he didn't want to get, and he had paid for me to go to Israel. And I was coming back, so it was anathema to him. And so that's why I got fired. The second time I got fired by liberal Zionists, so. Uh, assuming that, uh, uh, assuming that the U.S. still is a democracy in ten years, and that the numbers continue to go the direction they are, the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party gets a supermajority and ends the special relationship with Israel. Is it, have you or others who know more than I do done a serious analysis of? where Israel goes once they are untethered from the United States in the world, which now we're coming to an end of a 30 year period where there's only one superpower and we're entering a period where there's a, there's a polarity to which Israel could go to the other side. Could you say some, something more about that? You know, I mean, just ending the relationship wouldn't necessarily in the Israel, no. Um, the question is like, uh, if, um, if what comes, what I'm predicting comes to pass, and the special relationship with the United between the United States and Israel ends in ten years, what are the consequences for Palestinians of that, and what does Israel become? Where does Israel go if, if they're no longer tethered? <coughs> Right. First, let me say that um, I'm not, uh, I, uh, I'm told by a Sovietologist, a friend of mine was studying Sovietology, the uh, Soviet Union, in grad school in 1985, or uh, when did the wall fall? Uh, 89? Yeah, 89. Okay. And he said he was studying Soviet history and with, in, at some fancy college at grad school. And he said none of his professors five years before that predicted the wall falling. So I, I'm not a professor, and I hesitate to predict what, but because God knows if you've been to Israel, all you can, I think that in Palestine, the one thing that you can predict is that this is going to end. This is, this is, the conditions here are what created a civil war in the United States that killed 700,000 people. I don't know what percentage of our population that was at the time. Um, uh, that um, created the Algerian civil war. That um, this, they have created conditions of oppression there that could create a, a massive bloody uh, outcome. So they are terrifying conditions, I think, that you, you, you you're struck by how much restraint Palestinians have shown. That's the main thing, feeling I, how restrained they've been. I would not accept that we would be, in the United States, we would be up in the hills with guns if they were taking property away from people. To your point, uh, the key moment in that progress is that, uh, that we all look forward to is when they stop giving $3.8 billion a year. Now, some in the, the squad are saying stop that 3.8 billion, and a lot of people are starting to say that it's becoming a plausible idea. My friend, uh, an Israeli journalist, Yossi Gerbitz, now deceased, said the moment the United States cuts off aid to Israel is the Saigon helicopter moment in Israel. And he was saying, what he would say, is that that signal, that is the most entitled society in the world. They have a GDP, you know, a, a GDP that's higher than France, higher than Japan, uh, and yet they're getting 3.8 billion in aid in the, from the U.S. all the time. They get a blank check in the UN, etc. They, they're 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 entitled and spoiled and hubristic and arrogant. So when that signal happens, he said that's the moment that people are trying to get out of, they, 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 they see this whole thing sliding and they're gonna try to get, so I think, I don't, I don't know, he predicted that it would produce great uh, catastrophe inside Israeli society. Uh, others have said it becomes a rogue state, 
You know, it's just another rogue state and it's apartheid and um, uh, it's at more ethnic cleansing than ever. I don't think that's the case because the American Jewish community is so tied to them, uh, to Israel, uh, that it will, short of that moment, it will demand some changes. I think that in, in the sort of hopeful, idealistic view of this, um, the American Jewish community comes to its senses, the uh, American Congress comes to its senses, and they say, you've got to have equal rights for all people there. You've got to do what South Africa. This is apartheid. This is worse than apartheid. These guys who put out a report for, Car for Car Carnegie this year, Brookings, establishment um, uh, scientists, uh, political scientists in Washington, inside the Beltway, uh, scientists put, uh, political scientists put out this report saying it's apartheid. And uh, in the Council on Foreign Relations, I think it was in Foreign Affairs magazine, which is published by the Council on Foreign Relations. So they crossed that, you know, the thing that Jimmy Carter got thrown out of the party for 2006, now people are saying inside the Beltway, and the voice of the coming closer, and these guys said when they announced their paper, they said, there are people in the White House who say to us, it's apartheid, but they can't say it publicly. So I feel that when the political establishment finally accepts that truth, instead of clinging to two-state solution, that they could demand, and in the hopeful ideas that they could force Israel to start to change and to give people a vote, give them the franchise. It's insane. You know, people always say, what would you, what would you do? What would you do? I would say, well, the first, I give them the vote. John. <clears throat> The question, the point was that Hannah Arendt said uh, in the 40s, she wrote that uh, uh, it would be uh, Israel becoming an armed state, if it, it, an armed state in a hostile environment. She called it a Sparta. She said, you were creating a Sparta here. And she had said, by, by uh, ethnically cleansing and by excluding uh, Palestinians. Yes, there have been many Jewish prophets who have said uh, these things, which is plain as the nose on your face. And, you know, Truman said, uh, um, I think he had his arm twisted uh, by his uh, uh, Kaufman and Stone, other Jewish donors, uh, to and Jews in the Democratic Party to recognize. Truman said, I've seen a lot more fights over religion than I have over money. I don't think you should go this. I don't think you should be a religious state, you know, and common sense tells you it was a bad idea. Sir? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for coming here. Oh. Uh, we're honored to have you. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here. One of the assistant, the associate minister here. Um, yeah, so I'm the assist assistant pastor here. And um, so I, I'm wondering if you can offer a little bit of advice for uh, Christian religious leaders who work closely with our Jewish uh, siblings um, in interfaith partnerships and how we can. Uh, and we have a very close relationship with uh, our Jewish siblings here in town. and. Um, but we're also very interested, I think both myself and the senior pastor are, are very committed to wanting to take this congregation into deeper solidarity with uh, Palestinians. And so what your advice might be in how to navigate that complex relationship? Repeat. Sarah's question, Sarah's, yeah. Sarah's question was um, uh, for faith leaders in the Christian community who care about just justice and uh, having a stronger uh, relationship with Palestinians and with that narrative, how do you navigate the relationship with Jewish friends? Uh, or, and I assume politically kindred in many issues, yes. Um, 
I, it's such a it's such a hard question, and I um, I I don't I'm a firebrand, and for many years I was radioactive, and many people would tell you I'm anti-Semitic, um, a self-hating Jew. Um, friends of yours in that community will tell you that I'm a self-hating Jew. Um, so I, it's, it's so it's a really hard thing. Um, I must tell you. I mean, so I don't. Um, I don't counsel this for you. Um, and obviously, everyone chooses their own path. And uh, I, I respect. I, I think it's a great and important question. I urge you. I know you'll follow through in sincere and kind ways, um, and, but I chose, at some point, I chose ostracism for that community. I said if the price of being in the community is supporting Israel, it's not a hard choice for me. I have to choose ostracism. And at that point in life, emotionally, I had enough, I was married to someone who wasn't in that community, uh, I had enough support that I was able to choose ostracism. And I mean, the good news is that uh, there are people organizing now inside. So I reflect the scars of an 18 year struggle. Uh, the good news is that there are a lot of young Jews who I think will be more welcoming. and. There are, I'll send you, uh, there's one thing that I found um, lately. There are, there are a lot of young Jews who are very communally oriented and who would say, it, or better correspondent with you on this question, because they would stand here and they would say, I grew up in this community. I, I'm not, I'm a little bit of a, a free thinker anyway. My parents were eccentric, so I wasn't really deeply involved in the Jewish community, uh, religious community. But there are young, many young Jews who were formed by that community, who went to Jewish day schools and the like, and who uh, worship in Jewish spaces, and whose friends, they went to Jewish summer camp. Their friends are mostly Jewish, uh, who say, I'm going to be out as an anti-Zionist in this community. Bless them. God bless them. You know, I'm glad. It's very important. I, they weren't there when the choice was on. So I think they may be building a space that you will be able to find, even in Fort Wayne. But I, beyond that, I can only say a word real quick. Uh, Sarah's question. Say a word real quick. I mean, just summarizing. People like Mark Braverman, Brant Rosen, and, and the work of JVP and some of the rabbis who are part of JVP Rabbinical yeah. Council. Yeah, I mean, there is a... Resources, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Michael knows this better than I do. Uh, I mean, he, or he works... I, well, J Jewish Voice for Peace is an anti-Zionist Jewish organization. <clears throat> now, when you tell your friends in the organized Jewish community here, they would say they're a little too, you know... They would trash, I think they might trash JVP. I love JVP, but those resources exist. But I think the younger ones, the J JVP said, we're gonna build our commune where we're gonna build it, and we're gonna build it intersectionally. Um, but there are these younger Jews, like If Not Now, uh, is an organization of very communal Jews. And now there's something called J-O-O-O-T, Jute. I forget what it stands for. They had a piece on Mondo Weiss, and they said they also are organizing communally as anti-Zionists. So they're trying to square the circle. I couldn't square the circle. I said, I'm leaving the circle, you know. But there are people now who, out of love for the Jewish community, are organizing inside the church. So I have hope on that. So. Next question. Does anyone have anything? If any of y'all want to say something, you know, I'm eager to hear from y'all. So uh, <laughs> say a word about what we've just been reading about in the news, the U.S. waiver program, and why that's why that's such an important issue that we should be paying attention to. 
Well, certainly you all are aware about that the United States just put Israel in the visa waiver program. And the United States is working to bring about Saudi normalization with Israel. They're, they're giving up, they're gonna give Saudi Arabia, allow nuclear enrichment, put them in a defensive shield, do all these gifts to, to uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who you know, killed a, uh, a journal, you know, these human, human rights. And he's, Biden's doing this to please the Israel lobby. Uh, for the 2024 election. He's pleasing APAC before the 20, he's making. So I think it's very cynical and it's uh, everything against what I'm saying. I'm saying we're winning and Biden is saying, you're on the outside, man. You're on the fringes of the Democratic Party. And come, the platform, watch when the platform comes, the platform fight, because I think you may remember when um, there was an uprising on the floor of the LA Convention in 2012 um, when uh, the platform, they announced uh, uh, Jerusalem is the capital, undivided capital of the state of Israel. And uh, the people on the, on the uh, they put that up to vote and the whole convention started booing, you know? And they pushed it through and Obama said, Obama, said to Villa Rigosa, the mayor of uh, LA who was running the convention, he said, this has got to go through. So Obama pushed that through for the 2012 election because he needed the organized Jewish community behind him in 2012. And you remember uh, Netanyahu lectured Obama in the White House in 2011 or so when Obama said that the 67 line should be the basis of a Palestinian state. And uh, Netanyahu lectured him, and uh, Obama not only had to swallow it, but uh, he had to go call all the Jews. Ben Rhodes had to call the Jewish donors and say, uh, yeah, Netanyahu was right. So that's what Biden's going through now. Biden is giving endless gifts to, to Netanyahu because Biden thinks this is the only way I'm going to keep the Israel lobby on my side. Yeah. I just want to say thank you for sharing your personal part of the story. I think it's an important thing for all of us progressives to recognize that there's an internal struggle with your own community and fitting in and where, you know, what price do I pay and what's worth paying the price. So I want to thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Absolutely. But, so have you, have you also experienced some of that uh, yes. struggle? Yes. Yes. Well, yes. You have my solidarity. Thank you. I mean, one of the things about that is, you know, uh, I remember I said to my partner, uh, who, I got a partner in the this website after a few years, and I said, um, uh, and he's, he's much younger and more uh, radical than I am, and I said, you know, you go to, you start advocating for Palestinians and you, you start walking in their shoes a little, you know? You start advocating for them. You know, I was saying I've lost jobs. I've been smeared as an anti-Semite. You get a taste of the Palestinian experience when you start advocating for them. And he bridled at that because we don't know what it's like to be Palestinian. We don't know what it's like to have our family in jail, to have our little sister killed. You know, we haven't been through that. Uh, I've only lost two jobs. You know. E-F-T, you know? So, uh, you know, prime me a river. Um, so I think that that is the nature of solidarity work, is that uh, you regard your afflictions, if you're a mature person, you accept these afflictions as a uh, small cost to pay uh, to be involved in a struggle of such importance. Uh, and, you know, for me, and I think this is, this for me is like, I, I this is, like being an abolitionist in the 1840s and 50s. It's a great evil, and it's uh, one, slavery had many, had a host in the North, you know, and then uh, had a, uh, the establishment was all behind it until it wasn't. And, you know, uh, Lincoln was for recolonizing, you know, uh, blacks back to Africa. And, uh, had to apologize for being anti-slavery in the 1859 campaign uh, for president. So um, uh, the establishment is all for Israel. The establishment was for slavery, and uh, 
you know, this is what a great struggle involves. And we're very, I feel very privileged. I feel very privileged to be, have made a living doing this and to be engaged in uh, having such a sense of purpose and meeting people like Michael and yourself and Linda and Gary, I mean, and Quentin and uh, Matt and so many others. I mean, I, I, I meet Kindred Sword and it's very inspiring to me that people in the middle of the country uh, without my reasons, you know, you know, uh, have taken on a cause that can cause so much personal distress. Let's say thank you to Folks, uh, thanks for coming out tonight, and we'll see you at the gala on November the 4th.